Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're finally able to share the brand new AMD server processors codenamed Milan, and those are the AMD EPIC 7003 series. These processors are AMD's newest generation of processors that are going to carry the EPIC line through 2021 and all the way up until we get to Genoa in 2022. But frankly, this video comes at a very weird time for the industry because, well, let's just take Milan, for example. Milan has been shipping for revenue to customers, I think, since like Q3 of 2020. We got our first chips in November of 2020, although AMD wasn't really too happy about that. But that happened. On the next generation Intel Xeon Ice Lake, Intel's already shipping those for revenue. And they're, they haven't actually formally launched yet, but you know we know the performance of them. We just can't talk about it. And in the market, that's actually kind of a big deal because what that practically means is that the Milan chips, we can only really compare them performance-wise to what, well, I guess Cascade Lake, which was a derivative of the 2017 Sky Lake, or we can go to Cooper Lake, which is also a derivative basically of the 2017 Sky Lake. But those are like our two options. We don't have the real competitor, which is the Ice Lake Xeon that we can talk about right now. But I think I have a way that we can at least have that discussion without having the actual discussion. So basic game plan for this video is that first we're going to look at the AMD Epic 7003 series Milan, you know, SKU stack pricing, like what, what are the actual chips that are launching today? We're then going to go and talk about some of the improvements that AMD made from the Epic 7002 series, which is Rome, to the 7003 Milan series. We're going to go into the performance and power consumption. And of course, the new version is well faster and it uses more power. And then I'm just going to show off just a couple little platforms that we're going to be doing, actually some actually really big platforms that we're going to be doing features on uh, that we already have that we're reviewing. And so I'm going to just show off a couple of those just to kind of give you an idea of how the market is receiving Milan and then creating new server platforms in segments that Milan really and Rome, I guess, really didn't access prior to this launch. Then what I want to do is inform you and kind of give you some idea in terms of how to think about Milan in the context of what Intel has publicly stated and shown us about Ice Lake already. Now, we went through all of the public bits on the next generation Ice Lake Xeons, and I think we actually have enough that we can frame a good discussion or at least a good discussion guide that will let you talk about Milan and Ice Lake intelligently and what each are going to offer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to synthesize that into kind of giving you in the audience a high level guide that you can use to think about how you would plan your infrastructure purchases and where these chips are really going to be good and where I think Intel is going to be good. And if that seems like it's an absolute lot, well, hey, look, it is. I know the STH team has been working for weeks getting ready for this. And I know that the pieces that we have on the STH main site typically are read by just tons of people. I mean, those things are just huge pieces. They're often, you know, I don't know what this one's going to end up being, but seven, 10, maybe even more than 10,000 words. They become big reference pieces pieces. And so this is the first time that we're really doing a video accompanying that. If you want to get more detail, I would definitely suggest go to opening that. We're gonna have a link in the description, check it out. There's gonna be a little bit more detail because we're just going to kind of skim through some of the high level details that I speak. And so you can go and do that deep dive if you want to on some of the parts. As part of the AMD Epic 7003 Milan series, AMD is launching a total of 19 new public SKUs. And of those, there are four P SKUs, which are only for single socket, as well as four high frequency, so frequency optimized SKUs. Since we get this question every once in a while, you can use a two socket SKU in a single socket server, but you tend not to do that because the single socket SKUs are much less expensive. On the frequency optimized part, those are really SKUs that are designed because there are a lot of software packages and licenses out there that are licensed on a per core basis instead of on a per socket or per server basis. And when you have that per core licensing, having higher performance cores rather than more cores is often more cost effective. Now, when we say that there are 19 SKUs, that's really only kind of part of the story. There are six SKUs from the AMD Epic Rome series that are also going to continue into this next generation Milan. So you're still going to purchase at some price points and some, I guess, capability points, the Rome series CPUs. Something that I noticed when I looked at the six SKUs is that the vast majority of them are the four channel memory optimized SKUs that AMD had in the Rome generation. We actually did a video and an article on what that is. But effectively, what AMD does is they have a set of SKUs that have only a certain number of CCDs active and the placement of those CCDs are optimized for only four of the eight channels of memory being populated. 
And that really is a response to the folks that are coming from the Intel Xeon E5 generation where you had four channel memory. And if you didn't necessarily wanna put a whole bunch of memory into a system and you just wanted a low core count and low memory amount, that is actually a good way. And that's a way that AMD has to optimize their platforms for you know those kind of lower memory counts where you're only gonna put four DIMMs in. Now we're going to flash up the SKUs, but I wanna give a couple high points. The first one you're gonna notice is that in terms of list price and price per quart, you're gonna see that there is a migration upward. It's not necessarily a linear migration on all of the SKUs, but at some point you're gonna see that all of the SKUs at the same level are going up in price. I think that kind of makes sense. Milan is faster on a per core basis. And so I think AMD is starting to capture some of that value. The other side to it is from a competitive standpoint, Intel tends to have higher list price parts. And then realistically, what's happening is that there's a pretty fierce discounting war that's happening on deals. And so by having a higher list price on the AMD CPUs, it means that vendors can then discount more and make it look like they're giving a bigger percentage off to hit their street prices for their servers. And just to give you some sense of that discounting, so that way you can all, you know, be realistic here is just if you're like a cloud provider or something like that, the 64 core SKUs that are on this price list, basically those cloud providers are paying less than a third of what you're seeing there. I think the other side to it is just that AMD has been a little bit supply constrained in terms of server processors. And so I think this is really just AMD saying, well, you know, we can't make enough of these things anyway. So why are we selling them for a bigger discount than we need to? So maybe we should get a couple extra dollars out of it. I think that totally makes sense from a business perspective. And that's kind of what you'd expect. Two other points that I think are very related are the fact that the TDPs are generally up in this generation. So we actually see a formal launch 280 watt TDP part. And that is something that we did see in the previous generation. We did a review of the AMD Epic 7H12. We did a video of that as well, which we can link. And that's now a formal SKU. So with those higher TDPs, AMD is able to go and raise their clock speeds up a little bit. And that's one of the big benefits of Milan is that you get two things. You get the IPC benefit, but then you also get higher clock speeds. And that gives you a lot more performance than on the previous gen. The other big thing that you're going to notice is the fact that there are 56 and 28 core parts. I can tell you the exact 100% reason that AMD has 28 and 56 core parts. And I don't think it's necessarily because they said, hey, I wonder if we could do like a seven CCD design. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? The real reason for that, let's just, let's just call it what it is, is because, well, AMD is responding to Intel's 28 core Cooper Lake. They have the 28 core Cascade Lake, Sky Lake. So there's this whole market where everybody's just used to getting 28 cores. And for AMD and its partners, by having 28 and 56 core parts, they can tell the story of, oh, well, we have 28 fast cores as well, and we can go head to head on that. Or we can go and say dual socket consolidation and have 56 cores in a single socket. And that gives you some benefits as well. The overall pricing methodology is pretty simple. The high frequency parts are definitely a little bit more costly than the just kind of standard parts. The P parts are of course less costly than their standard part counterparts because well, AMD is trying to push that idea that you can consolidate from a two socket server into a one socket server with their platform. But overall the cost per core has gone up in this generation. So let's talk a little bit about the actual new chip and what does that even mean? Now, instead of going through this in excruciating detail, what we're gonna do is we're gonna flash up these slides from AMD that explain the differences. However, on the same token, if you do know the difference between like the Ryzen 3000 series and 5000 series when we went from Zen 2 to Zen 3, I think you're gonna totally understand what's going on here. AMD makes cores that they then leverage over a number of different products. So the way that they look at it is they have a team that does cores and then they have an SOC team that takes all of those cores plus some of the connecting IP and creates the SOCs that are sellable units for them. Zen 3 is an updated microarchitecture. And so as a result, you actually get higher performance per clock and AMD did optimization. So that every clock cycle, the chip can actually do, or the SOC can do more work. And the idea there is that even at the exact same clock speed, you'd get more work and AMD puts in, they say 19%, but we have tested it is more than the previous gen. So the idea is that even if you have the same clocks, you get more performance on this gen versus the previous gen. But then the other secret sauce of Milan is that you also get higher TDPs and higher clock speeds. So you get a double boost. You get a boost from the IPC, but then you also get a boost from the higher clocks. Again, if you wanna go into those details, go check out the STH main site. Talk a little bit about the SOC real quick. What you're gonna see is that generally the SOC is pretty similar. You still have the same core counts, basically the same TDP ranges-ish. Now these chips use SP3, which we saw with Naples, Rome, 
we see with Milan now, but the one big change is that you cannot use a Milan chip in an old Naples platform. You need the newer Rome platform for it. Perhaps the biggest change of Zen 3, and the one that we're going to show you something that's actually really kind of cool on when we get to the performance section, is the fact that the CCX structure, which is kind of how AMD clusters their cores, it used to be that on a die, a compute die, you'd, which is a CCD, you'd end up having two CCXs in Rome. So you'd have four cores and 16 megabytes of level three cache that would be kind of be shared with those four cores. And then the challenge is that there would be two hemispheres on a single CCD. So you'd have another four cores and another 16 megabytes of memory. And while those sat on basically the same physical chip, one of the big challenges was that often when you had to cross the barrier and you had to go say from something that was in, in one side and you had to go to the other side, you'd end up having to do a hop, what it looked like through the IO die, and that created a lot of latency. Something that's fairly well known in the virtualization world on Rome is the fact that there is a little bit of a latency hit when you go from like say four cores and you start building VMs that are bigger than that, or if you have a hypervisor that's not aware of this this architecture. Zen 3 actually really changes this because now we can have that 32 megabytes of total cache that's available to all eight cores without having to go hop over to the IO die. We get some benefits from the infinity fabric and being tied to the memory clock frequencies, but at the end of the day, you know, the big thing is the fact that that structure on the cores has changed, plus we get some uplifts on the microarchitecture. You're still getting 128 lanes of PCIe Gen 4 in single socket. You get 128 lanes of PCIe Gen 4 in dual socket with 64 going to both sides or both CPUs. And then you also have the ability to reroute 16 lanes from each of the CPUs instead of going from a CPU to CPU or as XGMI, you get to use this as PCIe Gen 4 lanes if you want, which means you get a total of 160 PCIe lanes in that configuration. We actually did a video on how in a Dell PowerEdge R7525, that's actually a configurable feature. So you can configure the exact same server with different cabling solutions to either have an extra you know, link between the two CPUs, or you can use that for additional say NVMe SSDs. But all the features like the HNL DDR4-3200, those are all still there as well. Now we don't have this part, but the AMD EPYC 72F3 is a really interesting part. Now that's an eight core CPU, which in the previous generation, you would have an eight core CPU and you could have a core on each die, but if you had a core on each die, you'd only still get 16 megabytes of level three cache because of the old topology. But now AMD can actually offer basically a single active core with 32 megabytes of level three cache on each die and then have eight of those dies and create an eight core processor with 256 megabytes of level three cache. Now I know we have a lot of people out there that are definitely thinking back and like, oh my gosh, I remember having a single core PC and I remember getting to 32 megabytes of memory and that was amazing. And well, now you get that 32 megabytes of memory, but that's just your level three cache. And you get eight of those on a single CPU that is a low core count CPU. Now we've already talked about the four channel optimized SKUs and we've the eight channel makes sense because eight channel memory. So of course, you know, if you have eight channels memory and you have eight DIMMs populated or 16 DIMMs populated, that's gonna make a lot of sense. But something that is new in this generation, again, a little bit of a competitive nod to Intel. And the competitive nod is kind of clearly towards the Skylake, Cascade Lake, and now Cooper Lake generations, where you have six memory channels and up to two DPC, so you have up to 12 DIMMs per channel. The AMD guys literally now have not just the 28 and 56 core CPUs, but they also have six channel memory. So if you have an organization that just doesn't want to put that extra dim or two dims in each socket, well, now you have an option that's more like a Skylake. Now, AMD does have updated security features in this generation. We're just going to do another slide flip here. But it is important to note that AMD has been winning because they had this really confidential computing segment down and they've been starting to win with companies like Google and clouds like Google prior to Intel having really SGX up and running with their confidential computing solution in the mainstream Xeons. And so AMD actually has a little benefit here. And so we're seeing that they're getting some more expanded functionality. We did also talk a little bit about how the AMD PSB feature is being used by Dell to vendor lock AMD Epic CPUs. So we have a video on that, we'll link that in the description. On the performance side, AMD really had us focus on three SKUs. We had two of their 64 core SKUs and then we had a frequency optimized 32 core part as well. 
Frankly, I don't really like when that's the option. There is definitely a reason for that. And the reason for it is just frankly that those are the really skews that if you're going to compare to something like in Cascade Lake Refresh Part, they're going to look very favorable in comparison because you just simply have more cores. Again, this goes back to the fact that we're just in a weird period where Intel essentially has a updated version of their 2017 chip in the market with 28 cores maximum. And so AMD is now on their second generation 64 core parts and really just frankly can show that you have a two to one consolidation ratio based on sockets, no problem. They were able to show that with Rome, but now again, they're able to show that with Milan. But there is one thing that you might not see in a lot of other places, but we've actually run into this when we've been using Rome chips. We do use Rome chips to do things like host STH. So if you go to STH, the main site, part of that will be on Rome chips. But specifically, if you do create VMs that either cross the CCX or CCD boundaries. So those are really like, you know, the four core for the CCX and then CCD eight core boundaries. You actually see that you do take a pretty significant performance hit just by making VMs like that. And so what you'll see is that in some of your tail latencies, you'll end up not, you'll get some like really high numbers on your tail latencies when you start doing that in some situations. And this is really what Intel comes back and kind of knocks AMD on, which says, well, hey, we have this old fashioned monolithic die. We don't really have that same challenge because we're staying all on the same piece of silicon. For things like hosting STH, this is absolutely fine, but there are people that do really care about this stuff and see these little jitters as, as a big deal. And so that's really where we wanted to go and spend a lot of time focusing our efforts because we were actually able to see this with our virtualization benchmarks previously. And so now we were able to see the improvement generation over generation. So what we're gonna do is just kind of look at what happens when we cross from four cores and we go into that eight core realm. And you can see that you get much better performance on your VM sizes when you do that. A lot of the more micro benchmarks and a lot of benchmarks, frankly, that you see uh, they fit really well into the AMD caches, especially with the new 32 meg L3 cache. That, that's something that you're just gonna see that you get great performance because AMD is doing so much caching. They just they have just giant caches on board. They're able to do that. And so on the micro benchmarks, you don't necessarily see the difference because even with 16 megs, you often hit that same case. But realistically, a lot of the people that are gonna go purchase things like the 64 core CPUs that we have to review, they're gonna be using them for virtualization. Let's face it, virtualization is a giant area right now. And even if it's not virtualization, using containers and running mixed workloads on the same CPU instead of a CPU running just one workload, I think is gonna be more common on these chips. That's just the way that the industry is going. And so that's why I really like to go and we spend a lot of time being able to show these types of differences. On power consumption, we tend to do power in servers rather than just talking about CPU power consumption, just because number one, you don't buy CPUs, you buy CPUs and put them in servers to go use. And so servers are really the unit that really matters. But I also wanna just give some sense in terms of performance. So with the 64 and 280 watt TDP Epic 7763, we could get our Daytona test platform to go just over 900 watts of power consumption without really trying too, too hard. We weren't hitting like a kilowatt with it, but we're still over 900 watts. Well, that may seem like a lot when we compare that to what Intel has that's in that same core range, you're basically at four sockets with the Cooper Lake Intel Xeon Platinum 8380H, which are all 250 watt TDP parts, which gives us one kilowatt of TDP versus 560 on the AMD side. Now they're all the platform bits, but just kind of giving a sense, we just did a review linked in the description where we looked at a gigabyte server with these four processors and performance wise, they're pretty close. But on the other hand, that gigabyte server was using just over 1.6 kilowatts max, whereas this was using just over 900 watts. Now there are a little bit of differences in terms of the platforms, but at the same time, that kind of gives us some sense of just how much more power the Intel chips are using than the AMD chips when we kind of look at the power per core. Of course, that's gonna change with Ice Lake, but we just can't really talk about that yet. And a final fun one on networking, we actually got to use our new Mellanox or NVIDIA Mellanox ConnectX 6 200 gig ethernet cards with PCIe Gen 4, we're able to drive a 200 gigabit ethernet port and only one port on each card, but we can still do one port of 200 gig ethernet just in a standard by 16 PCIe Gen 4 slot. 
Well, I think a lot of the just kind of normal enterprise high speed, if you really want to get a lot of networking out of your server, you're probably going to do 200 gig ports instead of a 200 gig port these days, just based on switches and what have you. We did just review a 400 gig ethernet switch, but still I think 100 gig makes a lot more sense. For some of the folks that are using the Milan series in high performance computing, this is roughly-ish equivalent to a 200 gigabit per second InfiniBand connection. And so that just kind of gives you a sense that you can scale up your interconnect. And I know the InfiniBand people are like, no, we're way better than Ethernet. But like, let's face it, they're 200 gigabit-ish connections and way faster than the 100 gig connections. And frankly, before the Ice Lake Xeon's launch with PCIe Gen 4, well, AMD is the only platform that can go drive this that's x86. Just really quickly, I wanted to highlight a couple just kind of partnerish systems that we're looking at. First one, just from Tyen, we have a single socket platform that has a total of 16 DIMM slots. And one of the really interesting things that you see is that AMD actually doesn't have low end SKUs. They don't have like those like Xeon bronze or Xeon silver competitors really. Now, the reason that AMD doesn't have many of these low TDP CPUs is just it's more efficient because you have that big IO die to go and populate more of the compute x86 dies that sit around that. And so you tend, the way that AMD tends to think about the low end is that, well, instead of having two Xeon silvers in a server, why don't you just do a single AMD Epic? And that is really what this tie-in server is designed to do, which is to be a single socket solution for Milan. And although we can't get into Ice Lake performance, of course, because of you know just how SKU stacks work, you are going to be able to go and do something like put a you know P-series processor and potentially do a two-to-one consolidation of your current Intel Xeon, you know, scalable Cascade Lake. You could do a Skylake consolidation. You could do definitely Xeon, any of these Xeon E5s. You can consolidate two to one, say, into one of these sockets. And we're going to look at a couple of them, but this will be probably the first system that we review that's really a single socket solution in this generation. Also just want to highlight a GPU solution. We have a NVIDIA A100, so their high-end GPU solution in the PCIe form factor. So we have a 2U server that has four NVIDIA A100 GPUs on the PCIe cards. And the system also is able to house two 64-core 280-watt TDP AMD Epic Milan CPU. So we have the 7763s in here. That is super cool because we get the benefits of being able to get 128 cores in a system like this and high performance computing cores in a system like this. Plus we can also get GPUs. And so seeing that we get the accelerator plus the really high performance x86, I think is really cool. But make no mistake, this is Milan taking a segment from Dell's customer base that used to be an Intel segment. And another example, though this server right here, you may never have seen before, but you're going to probably notice that there's a Microsoft label on it. And this is actually Microsoft Azure is today on the launch day of Milan going to open up their brand new instances that are Milan based. And so if you want to go create a supercomputer out of Milan, you can go do that today with the Microsoft Azure. On the pre-briefing call, Microsoft told us that they're using an AMD Epic 7 V13. V tends to be the Microsoft part. I don't really know why it's V, but that just is what it is. And so that isn't one of these you know, parts that you're going to see listed on the SKU sheet. But when Microsoft told us that that's what they're using, let's face it, Microsoft Azure is huge. And so, of course, if they say, hey, we want to have a 240 watt TDP 64 core processor with these you know, specs, Amy's going to go figure out how to make that happen so they can sell a whole bunch of them. Microsoft also told us that they have been deploying this. And the reason that they are able to have day one readiness and day one availability of the brand new Milan high performance computing platform is because they've been deploying them for months already. And so going back to the idea that, you know, this launch is really after a lot of the hyperscale customers have already started deploying these. This is a really good example where the only way that you get day one availability of this brand new processor is because Microsoft has been doing that. All right, so let's get to the elephant or the ice elephant in the room, which is the Ice Lake Xeon discussion that we can't have, but we're going to have a little bit of anyway. The AMD Epic 7003 series is, let's face it, it's better. It's faster on IPC basis. You get a little more TDP, so you get the room to go and have higher clock frequencies. You get the new structure with the caches. And so overall, you know, there is definitely a big benefit to the new generation of processor. 
But in terms of platform, we're basically getting the same-ish platform that we got with Rome. It's nowhere near the giant jump that we saw from Naples to Rome or 7001 to 7002 series. And frankly, Genoa, when we get to the next generation of parts, is going to be another just giant leap. I was talking about it internally, and the analogy I used was, was like, well, Naples to Rome was like when Naples was like the rockets that you shoot up and they're only one time uses. Rome was when Elon Musk and SpaceX figure out, hey, we can actually land these things and then they reuse them. And then Milan is kind of like, well, we, I think we can make Falcon 9 a little bit better by doing a couple improvements and that makes it a little bit more usable or reusable. And that kind of makes Genoa like Starship. And that was very challenging not to come up with a car analogy because that's where I first go. So let's talk a little bit about what we know about Ice Lake and well, what we can infer, right? So Ice Lake was supposed to come out years ago. And frankly, the 10 nanometer process delays have delayed Ice Lake. I don't think anybody's debating that at this point. It's just, it's way behind schedule. Ice Lake was supposed to be a competitor to Rome, which would have put it in 2019. But here we are in 2021, almost done with Q1. And Intel still hasn't launched it yet, but you can buy it. We already know that Ice Lake is going to be based on the new Sunny Cove course. So we are going to expect some microarchitectural improvements. Kind of the same way that we knew that when we went from Zen 2 to Zen 3 on the desktop side from Ryzen 3000 to Ryzen 5000 as an example, we would see something similar on the server side. Intel has also shown off that they're going to have eight channel memory support. And since it's 2021, of course, we're going to have DDR4-3200 because that was like, you know, the new standard in 2019 and Cooper Lake already supports DDR4-3200. So of course, there are going to be some SKUs that are going to support DDR4-3200. We've already looked at the socket, which is LGA 4189. It's just the P4 version, not the P5 version for Cooper Lake. They're basically the same socket, just different notches to make sure that you're putting the right CPU in the right system. But that socket, as we showed with Cooper Lake and the 250 watt TDP parts is designed for higher TDP. So I would expect that not only is Intel going to be releasing 10 nanometer parts, but they're also going to be able to go to higher TDP because otherwise, well, why would you go to a new socket like that that's designed for higher TDP? Ice Lake has also been out for some time. And so we kind of expect that you'd see some new level of Spectre meltdown, you know, side channel attack vulnerability uh, mitigations in this new generation, just because you have another another opportunity to do it. Cascade Lake, that was one of the big features that we got when we went from Skylake to Cascade Lake. Intel takes it seriously. So I would expect that we would see something along those lines. And they're also gonna go and look at confidential computing. Intel's already started talking about confidential computing. And so most likely they're gonna use SGX or something like that to be able to go and address the confidential computing space that AMD has been selling chips into. Now I couldn't find that Intel's actually said that the Ice Lake Xeons are gonna support PMM 200. But if you go back and you look at the original release, it said that PMM200 can be used in AppDirect or memory mode with the third generation Xeon scalable processors. With the Cooper Lake that we already did a review of, those processors can only use the PMM200 in AppDirect mode. They can't use it in memory mode. So the only way that that would be a true statement that the PMM200 can be used with third gen Xeon scalable and memory mode is that Ice Lake needs to support memory mode. That is a huge deal. Optane PMM is totally an awesome technology we use it now uh, for some of our database hosting. So it is 100% a very just awesome technology and AMD just doesn't have an answer for it. So all told, the market for AMD Epic Milan is going to change significantly over what we had with Rome. Sure, Rome had more cores and we're gonna still see Milan with more cores as well. Like I don't expect Ice Lake just because of the fact that it's a monolithic die and it's been delayed so long. I don't expect Ice Lake is gonna beat AMD necessarily in cores. But at the same time, when you look at the platform, well, we get a channel memory, DDR4-3200. We get things like PCIe Gen 4. We get the more PCIe lanes anyway. And so the key change there is just the fact that if an organization was just looking to go get the new features, previously, the only way to go do that was to go get AMD. But realistically, when Ice Lake comes out, that's going to be the option. If you don't want to go to AMD, you can get that from Intel. But by that same token, AMD has been in market with PCIe Gen 4 for basically what, like six, seven quarters now. And by being in market with PCIe Gen 4 for all that time, while Intel just has been trying to get its Ice Lake chips out, what that's practically meant is that everybody in the ecosystem has had to validate. And if you wanted to put out your PCIe Gen 4 part, you had to do it on the AMD platform. I mean, Nvidia is like the sworn enemy 
of AMD. And at the same time, they are now using AMD Epic processors in most of their A100 line simply because that was the way that they could get a validated PCIe Gen 4 solution to market. And that is a big change because that means that everything basically will have gotten validated with Epic first and then Intel. Whereas when we were at the PCIe Gen 3 generation, we saw things like, you know, you couldn't do hot swap drives at, at the start with Naples because everything had originally been validated on Intel Xeon. And that was like the way that PCIe Gen 3 worked. And so Intel was already ahead and AMD was playing catch up. But now it's really Intel that's playing catch up to AMD. At the same time, there is a good chance that Intel is going to sell more Ice Lake systems than AMD will sell Epic systems if we're just kind of looking at market share numbers. And so as a result, I don't necessarily expect that like people won't get their parts validated with Intel. You'd be silly not to to take advantage of that if you were like a drive maker or something like that. But it does mean that AMD is probably going to be a little bit further ahead. So overall, if you're thinking about consolidating and you really want to go from like two sockets down to one socket in your server, then I think that AMD with their 64 cores and you know higher clock speeds and all that, I think that's going to make a absolute ton of sense even after Ice Lake comes out. I do think that the real battleground is not going to be necessarily at the 64 core parts because that's kind of a different, that kind of consolidation is like a different TCO calculation. I think where the really fierce competition is going to be is maybe in that like eight to 32 core range. But I really think that that segment where it's the lower end of the segment where both both AMD and Intel are, are fiercely competing in that two socket segment, I think that's going to be the one to watch. So let's get to server positioning because frankly, you probably just want to know how do you talk to your coworkers in terms of how do you come up with a plan in terms of Epic 7003 Milan versus Intel Xeon Isolate. And I'll kind of give you just a very high level view of that. So I think in the single socket market, what you're going to see is that Intel will most likely respond. I don't, I don't necessarily know this, but they already are responding with single socket only parts. I think you're going to see something similar because AMD is pushing that. And so Intel is going to have to respond. And you're also going to see, we did a piece on the Facebook Cooper Lake single socket only part, or something that looks probably a lot like a Facebook single socket only Cooper Lake part. So Intel will still have those bespoke solutions that they'll make for large customers. And Facebook is such a large customer that that actually is a very significant single socket platform. AMD in the single socket space with its P-series processors are still going to have a very strong, especially with those like those 64 core parts are going to have a very strong consolidation from two Intel sockets down to one AMD socket with their new parts. The two socket market, I think that's a little bit more interesting. If you're a customer and you just, you know, you have all Xeons right now, you just want to stay Intel, but you're looking at AMD because you're like, well, they have, you know, more memory channels and they also have PCIe Gen 4 and more lanes. I think that type of customer is really just going to look at Ice Lake and say, okay, well, this is probably what I want. I don't care about the 64 core parts or the super high core count parts. So I think Intel now has a solution for me and they're going to be okay with that. I think AMD is still going to have that consolidation bit where they're going to say, well, you know, we can go from four sockets to two sockets, or, you know, we have some other types of consolidation that you can do if you go onto the AMD Epic platform, just because we have more cores. And so I think that, that consolidation play is really AMD's strongest play there now. But I do really see that whole two socket market as a super competitive area. And when we get to the four socket market, frankly, the Cooper Lake systems that we looked at that have Optane persistent memory, I think that that's kind of its own segment. It's not necessarily competitive with these two socket systems. There may be a little bit of overlap where some vendors say, well, hey, customer, you can go from four sockets of Cooper Lake down to two sockets of AMD Epic Milan now. And I guess maybe that might happen, but the four socket market is pretty small anyway. So I don't necessarily think that that's like, you know, a huge portion of the story, but it is there. So while we can't necessarily get to that point where we are having that discussion of Milan performance to Ice Lake performance, hopefully that kind of gives you a framework where you can think through, here's what the this generation of 2021 servers is going to look like. Man, this is going to end up being a really long video because I feel like it's a long video just sitting here. And I also feel like we skipped over a ton of content that we're going to cover in our review. So of course, go check out the STH main site and just go through that. And if you want to go deep dive on a particular topic that I talked about, we're going to have more on that on the STH main site. And hey, if you've made it this far, definitely give this a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.